I'm Brian Ganson. I am Senior Fellow with the Fletcher School Center for Emerging Market Enterprises and also Senior Visiting Researcher with the Africa Center for Dispute Settlement here at the University of Stellenbosch Business School. This morning I gave a USB Leaders Angle talk. The topic was corporate operations in difficult environments. We looked at ways that companies, government, and society need to and can better engage uh, to together achieve inclusive growth. An edited version of my presentation follows. I'm going to start with some rather obvious statements just to ground us here. Uh, the first is that business needs government and society. Uh, business prospers where there is stability. Uh, many of you may have already seen the recent McKinsey report on economic growth in Africa. And one of the most gratifying things in that report is that government is doing a lot of things right across this continent. The second rather obvious statement I want to make is that society needs business. Uh, even our friends in the aid and development community here, the UK Secretary of State, are saying, wait a minute, we can't simply uh, buy our way out of these problems. We really need to think about how we invest in ways that solve our social problems, meet human needs. Uh, and then finally, uh, from a pretty good source, uh, we see that uh, government needs business as well. The case for business government community collaboration around inclusive growth is pretty obvious, right? It shouldn't be hard. Uh, so I want to take that as our starting point. That's where we need to be, that's where we should be, and there's no structural or strategic reason why we can't be there. Interestingly, as we started looking into this, trying to understand what's going on, uh, why is the relationship among these parties uh, somewhat broken, not delivering what we would hope it to, we suspected that we would see a fairly big difference between uh, North companies, European American companies investing in Africa, investing in South America, investing in Asia, and uh, local companies or South-based multinationals and their investments. And in fact, we heard very little difference. Tata, an Indian company investing in India, uh, built the first nano plant uh, in Singor province, $400 million US invested and had to walk away from it. Actually had to just uh, basically declare that a total loss and move the entire production plant because of conflict with the community that they couldn't figure out how to involve. An Indian company in India, it's not a problem of simply not understanding the context or not understanding the politics. We started with an effort to interview companies, hear their story. It's very easy to stand on the outside and th throw stones. So what we wanted to do, first of all, was say, tell us your story. What's going on? What's happening when you go into an emerging economy, uh, when you go into a transitional society uh, and you invest? Tell us the story. We identify an opportunity. We pursue that opportunity. We start getting our permits. We start thinking about hiring staff. What kind of physical plant do we need? All of our land rights. Uh, we do what we're supposed to do. Then something happens. We get surprised. And the company says, we try to respond. We try and do the right thing. We say, hey, guys, we'll fix the problem. We want this to work. And people start jumping all over us. Uh, and things go downhill from there. And this is a story we've heard over and over and over again from the company perspective. Companies, uh, uh, often at very responsible levels, CEOs, boards, reach the conclusion that developing countries are simply chaotic uh, and um, hostile environments for them. Again, my experience working with companies over the past two decades does not support the proposition uh, that they are simply evil and exploitative. In fact, on the contrary, you hear a lot of frustrated people saying, why can't we make this work? Uh, we say it's easy for business and society and government to come to the table together, uh, find some common ground, move forward. But in fact, there are a lot of big ticket questions on the table. Um, uh, if we take the context here, we have to ask you know, how do we balance reconciliation and justice? How do we both meet growth targets, but also make sure that human needs are met? So it is harder 
because every time you want to do something, it's in the shadow of these larger questions. The company is facing a proliferation of conflicting demands. And you start seeing how complicated the relationships are. Relationships has to be negotiated, has to be managed separately. And then somehow it's all supposed to come together. Executives on reflection uh, recognized, uh, uh, were able to highlight that the company itself is in some ways making things worse. Given that the reality is a society in transition and a lot of simmering conflicts, uh, it seems that companies are doing a pretty good job at making things worse rather than better. These three themes uh, were what we heard from companies reflecting on themselves. One of the things we heard on reflection from executives over and over again is we're not terribly good at understanding how they see the situation. We're creating jobs, we're paying our taxes, well, why isn't everybody happy? Right? Uh, part of the answer is that the agenda of government and the agenda of co the community are much larger than jobs and taxes. They cover things from public health and roads, uh, so quite tangible, to intangibles, like what about the delicate social balance we've worked out? When people were unhappy with us, we're not sure we ever gave them a way to tell us. The other thing we found over and over again were disconnects within the company itself. So, so pure management, governance, and accountability issues. The horizontal disconnects are very often uh, the people at the country management level, at the site level, have trouble getting the attention of the headquarters level. And then we have the vertical disconnects, the stovepipes, uh, um, that play themselves out particularly perniciously in these transitional societies where there is already a fair amount of instability. The company, in a sense, has created so many divisions that it's uh, closed itself off to really important insight and intelligence. If people are not happy with what you're doing, they will find a way to tell you. <laughs> um, and so we come to the standoff where the company is saying force majeure, it's chaotic out there, it's unpredictable out there, we can't do anything about it. Pipelines burn, sorry, it happens. And the government, civil society, communities are finding the company looking more and more like that evil corporation. Good news is that we see companies doing a lot of things right as well. And again, part of our research process was to understand how companies are overcoming these challenges. What changes are they making, particularly internally, to be able to be able to better engage externally? The first um, uh, may sound very simple, but it, in fact, from a management perspective, turns out to be quite hard. And it, it comes down to, repeat after me, we are not the center of the universe. Repeat after me, we are not the center of the universe. Communities, government, civil society do not wake up in the morning thinking about us and our performance goals. The second thing we see companies doing increasingly well is to stop treating socio-political issues and CSR issues as something that's bolted on to the corporation. Companies are starting to take what they know about the socio-political environment and building it into the business case and building it into the strategies. We also see companies realizing that the way they do business in Sweden or in Massachusetts uh, may not work really well. Like the Anglo-European American way of doing business is pretty much to say, I'll worry about my business, you worry about your business. Uh, we all know what the rules of the game are, so uh, uh, let's go. Uh, what we see happening uh, in a very positive way is companies investing in consultative and governance structures that include government and community explicitly as if they were part of the management of the company. There are some risks involved in building the trust of being transparent and open with our stakeholders. Uh, the other part that's really hard is to some level you're going to have to listen to them. right? Uh, it doesn't work to take the first step, invite everybody to the table and say, let's talk about it, and then ignore them. 
So you actually have to be prepared to change your strategy and change your operations based on what you've heard. One of the complaints that is most commonly heard with the most bitterness is they don't keep their promises. All these people show up, they say wonderful things, and they don't follow through. And again, it's part of the disconnect. You have the deal people who fly in, and their job is to get the paper signed. So what's the best way to get the paper signed quickly? You promise a lot. But once you move from the deal stage to the operations stage, the operation manager says, wait a minute, that's all against my margin. Uh, that's all cutting into my performance bonus, uh, a Canadian mining company. It says, well, what we do is we make the CSR people and the government relations people actually come to the operations meetings. Um, and they have to tell us what they're promising before they promise it. Uh, and the flip side is if they do promise it, we're responsible for delivering it. We're not going to leave them out on a limb either. What we do see uh, a variety of companies doing is saying, how is our system for management, our system for dividing up operational responsibilities going to account for the need to listen to and change our behavior because of what we're hearing from government and communities? So that if somebody sees a problem, and says, wait a minute, if we keep going down this road of importing everything instead of engaging local businesses, it's a lot more complicated, it's a lot more problematic, our logistics people don't like it, they're all into just-in-time delivery, but if we don't start empowering local businesses, we're gonna be in trouble. Maybe uh, what you're hearing from me uh, is a little bit the school teacher talking. Uh, this takes discipline within the company. A company that wants to successfully manage its relationships with communities, with government, that wants to be a constructive force in making that virtuous circle of government and community and business working together for inclusive growth, needs to exercise a lot of discipline internally in its management practices. Again, trivial to say, but probably worth reminding ourselves that the business environment, particularly in developing countries, is incredibly complex and getting more so. Uh, remember, this is good. This is, uh, things are more complex. I'm not saying they're worse. Uh, those of us who like democracy, who like accountability, who like transparency, this kind of complexity is OK. What that means, from my perspective, is we do need a different kind of corporate leader. If we talk to people who are in charge of international operations, developing countries, emerging markets, back to the 60s and 70s, what you generally saw in charge was the chief engineer, the person capable of solving the tough technical problems. Into the 80s, 90s, a little bit later here, uh, um, you saw a different kind of chief executive emerging who I might call the chief handshaker. There's a recognition that you needed market access, that you needed access to resources. You wanted to be the company that was permitted to move into India uh, or into Nigeria before the others. The leader from today forward really needs to start looking more like a chief diplomat, somebody who can engage with and understand where the other players in the constellation are coming from, government, civil society, communities, and then actually negotiate solutions. It's easy to say, let's bring everybody to the table. Let's find some common ground. Let's move forward with a plan. And then we'll make sure we all follow through. I'd say that in 20 seconds. But we all know it's harder than that. We know that making the structures work all the way from engagement through to follow through uh, is going to take a lot of work. And we're working on seeing where there are working models, uh, which ones we can propose. Uh, based on successful practice and some lessons learned. With that, I'm going to thank you for your attention. And uh, before even questions, just open it up for your own reflections. Uh, I imagine there's at least as much experience on these issues in this room uh, as I have, and I'd love to hear what you're thinking about. Thank you.